Welcome to the Pod Pod Cultcast, where we talk about life, love, learning, and libido, and share our journey through polyamory. I'm Max. I'm Hannah. I'm Chastin. And I'm Eric. What are we talking about today? We are talking about toxic monogamy culture. Dum, dum, dum. What does that mean? We kept seeing a, a post going around, I think it's an older one, from Tumblr, mm-hmm. from Nanking Decade. That asked the question, what I, you know, what I mean when I say toxic monogamy culture had a bunch of bullet points spawned or, you know, maybe borrowed from a bunch of different articles that we were looking at on the same topic. One of which is from allgo.org. What is toxic monogamy? We thought we'd discuss through. Oh, yeah. That's just come up, huh? Mm-hmm. That wasn't, that wasn't there before. Yeah, that was a good summary. <clears throat> so maybe we'll use this one to, to bounce ideas off of. Okay, great. So here's what I mean when I say toxic monogamy culture. If you truly love someone, you will never be attracted to anyone else. Oh, gosh. Max. Yes. How do you feel about that statement? Well, I think it's just truly baffling, right? The idea that <laughs> um, the idea that those two things are connected in any kind of way whatsoever. Love and attraction? Love and like cutting off your ability to be attracted to anyone else. Okay. You know? Mm-hmm. I agree with that. And for some people, you know, that happens, and that's cool, but it shouldn't be expected of everyone. It shouldn't be. Well, I mean, we're we're human beings, right? We're animals. Yeah. We're driven by hormones and chemicals and biological processes, and I was listening to a Dan Savage talk earlier today, and he was talking about the fact that, like, hey, we've been fucking for thousands and thousands of years. Like, we're the product of fucking. We should just embrace the fact that, like, we don't, like, grow up and then start having sex we grow up and start and sex starts having us because sex really takes over chemically in a lot of ways. This is a podcast where we talk about love and relationships, sex and kink and polyam issues and whatever else comes up. While we talk about those things, we'll probably also touch on stuff like abuse and violence and mental health challenges. These can be difficult topics, so keep that in mind moving ahead. You can't turn off your feelings. Feelings just happen and attraction is a feeling. Right, and to say, Eric, to say that, like, that does happen for some people, does it? Or is it just that some people don't act on it? Right, no, I really think that with some people, like, they'll meet somebody and, like, to them, they don't see anyone else the rest of their life. And that's yeah. possible. But to break it down, like, statistically, that would also be nearly impossible. Mm. Like, the, it, it couldn't be a normative expectation. Sure. I think that there are lots of unhealthy obsession habits that current society really cultivates. When I say that, I mean things like all of the the tropes about checking your partner's phone and the psycho exes and all that, where where somebody's obsessed with somebody. (laughs) Do you know what I'm saying? Am I making any sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's a current popular television show, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Like, these are are perfectly normalized. There's a current television show called Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. Yes. Yeah, I have no idea what it will, is, but I know I it will exists. mail you a VHS. Uh, uh, what is the address of your rock? And um, are you in the basement or like a sub-basement under that rock? I <laughs> live on top of the rock. <laughs> well, I've been, I've been thinking about this, and I didn't know where it would fall into the outline, but I'll go ahead and jump in with it now because we're kind of talking about it. Okay. Is that this kind of toxic monogamy, I think it reinforces tropes, it reinforces roles that we're supposed to play inside of relationships, right? Mm-hmm. There's the dumb dad, and there's, uh, you know, there's the Peggy Hill mom that has to be saved from her own silliness, and there's the, the other dad is the put-upon dad, who is mm. the who is the one who does the saving. And just Bundy, Al Bundy, just handing out cash. and Right, exactly. Right, right, right. You know, and I think that's all part of this, right? Am I right? I so I think yeah, so. Yeah. Well, to crystallize that, going back to what I was saying about it being a almost statistical impossibility, even though it is not likely, the societal expectation has made that the norm, and mm-hmm. people have tried to adapt to that to make that fit, even though it's kind of silly. In yeah. my opinion, well, it's silly. It bundled things though, so that you, if you want one thing out of a relationship, it necessarily has to come with all of these others. Right. right. So I think that. We could all sit here and, and say we understand and or have experienced relationships where romantic attachment and sexual attraction were not just a perfect package right. that always comes together. Mm-hmm. We can divide those things, but I, I definitely feel like a lot of people just can. Well, I think, you know, if we're going to talk about toxic monogamy, I think we should first say that 
Monogamy is a valid relationship style. Mm -hmm. It is a choice. You are choosing to commit to one person romantically and sexually and that that is perfectly valid and that is consent driven and there's nothing wrong with that. The problems arise when it is that you believe that you're supposed to have some kind of magical thing that turns off your attraction to everyone else. And there's supposed to be this magical thing that makes your partner want to use you for everything, that you're the end all be all. Um, Eric, in your episode, when we were getting to know you, you talked about having this storybook idea of romance and love. Would you consider the ideas that you had fall into this toxic monogamy category? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any examples of relationships you were in, if you want to talk generally about them? How did that toxicity manifest for you? One example would be, oh, well, I've done all of these things for you. Mm. I expect that you account for that and do all of these things for me. Oh, such as? Now I'm curious. <laughs> I moved across the world for you. Why are you being a bitch about that? <laughs> <laughs> As an Uh, offhand example. mm -hmm. (laughs) I think that's a pretty valid example. And that's your internalized thinking, right? I made this commitment. I made this sacrifice. Yeah, how can you say I'm not doing enough? I live in a whole different society for you. Now, looking back on that relationship, how do you feel about it? Do you still have those feelings? Um, No, not really. Because um, in in this particular framework of an argument, no, I wasn't doing enough. And it didn't fucking matter that I had moved across the world. I still wasn't pulling my weight. So I've talked before about the fact that relationships are not investments. We're not investing in somebody so that we get a return out of them. We're choosing to spend our time with somebody because they bring bring us joy. That's what I view as a healthy romantic relationship. Max, do you have any toxic monogamy from your past that you've experienced and how did you come through it and where are you today? Oh yeah, I mean, growing up with also toxic masculinity, my my entire framework for a relationship was toxic monogamy. Some of the stuff that you guys are talking about right now, like the transactional nature of a relationship, Mm -hmm. uh, was definitely a feature of some of my late teens, early 20s. Um, I also was, what's it, like the, the phrase is like, lock it down, you know? Like I oh, yeah. I strongly had feelings of like, oh, I really like this person. I got to lock this down. Right. Like I got to. I got to force them into a very serious commitment. So uh, mm-hmm. they're mine and they can't go anywhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I can't give a an example because every relationship I had was an example of that. Well, and, and we're not naming names. No, of course not. <laughs> well, and so you can name names with me. I feel like you yeah. and I came into our marriage with a lot of toxic monogamy ideals. You know, I came into the marriage with this very in a box idea of what romance was supposed to be and that was formed i call it the cosmopolitan quiz idea of romance like if you know the i would take quizzes and try to predict what was happening and and try to know everything about the person if i know everybody everything about the person then then i'm gonna be able to anticipate their needs and then they're gonna stay with me and never leave or they can't fight back or they can't fight back yeah yeah Oh, gosh. So there was a lot of, like, I have to lock this down with you. Mm. And, I'm you know, since we've moved past that, how do you think we did move past that? Honestly? Yeah. Time? Yeah. It'll, it will be a recurring theme that, like, I haven't done hard work, that you do a lot of work and you mm. do a great job. Thank you. But personally, I haven't done a lot of hard work. And together, there are ways that we have not done a lot of hard work. It's just that we've like kept battling Mm -hmm. and walking through the swamp Mm -hmm. until we, you know, get to a better place. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that you're absolutely correct. I feel, I feel like individually and in our, in our relationships with other people that are not you and I, I feel like you and I have grown a lot in just our view of the world and our politics and all of that stuff. And I feel like that's allowed us to kind of find a peace with one another where it's not possessive or clingy or or what have you because you and i have always had a um pursuer um pursuey kind of relationship (laughs) um hannah (laughs) hi hi you talked about being in a courtship yeah in your episode that was uh, our third episode would you define the relationship ideals that you had at that time as toxic monogamy absolutely yeah and um purity culture really amplifies this in mm-hmm. a way because it's not just you know it's not true love and until 
that one person obliterates your sense of ever being attracted to anyone again. It really is like that zero to 100 literally overnight kind of expectation where you know you're going through this whole courtship you're getting closer to somebody and you're not experiencing or at least not dwelling on any kind of physical attraction Mm -hmm. you don't have any kind of sexual relationship you don't talk about these things and then once you get married the light switch flips (laughs) and then you're just you know sexually available to each other always forever for the rest of your lives non-negotiable excuse me non-negotiably and so i think yeah that that really goes to an extreme of this that Mm -hmm. says like eric was saying you know you're backed in a corner (laughs) it's either this is love is real or i have you know all of these other feelings and thoughts which are perfectly normal it can't be both i can't have true love unless all of this just goes away right and as a as somebody who is like a fascinated viewer of that kind (laughs) of culture like there's also a kind of a sexual a sexual prosperity gospel that goes along with that right like the idea that we're not doing this now because later it's going to be so much hotter i think that's true yeah i think there's definitely a culture of saying like your sex life will be better and your marriage will be better in the long term because you had to wait which is just absurd from from a practical standpoint Mm -hmm. right because just like every other part of a relationship that makes it work it requires practice it requires communicating your needs none of that was part of the culture that i grew up in and i want to be clear like there are there are definitely brands of Christianity that completely demonize sex and talk about it as you know purely for procreation. I wasn't part of that. This is definitely seen as a positive thing within marriage, but there were just no tools to build that. Hmm. You know, it was just either I guess either it happens or you just learn to live without it. Yeah. <laughs> yikes. 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 yikes! One of the things that I always equate with toxic monogamy is like you said purity culture and the concept of virginity as a whole you know and it comes back to i think toxic monogamy in and monogamy in general just has roots in women are commodities women are the way through which we propagate the species let's gather them and keep them oppressed so that we can control them and what they're doing and our bloodlines and all that stuff and i think that virginity goes along with that that was just a little side note because it's a thing (laughs) i've been thinking about so hannah what else does the article talk about sure so toxic monogamy means the relationship capital r relationship Uh. always comes first So this puts everything in your life, everything you could possibly enjoy or experience in a hierarchy with your relationship to one person at the top. Yeah. Well, um, in polyamory, we do have people who engage in a hierarchy with their relationships. People will have primaries and secondaries. um, And that's either a formal thing where they have said, you are the the first person who's the most important. And then these other people come after you. Mm -hmm. And we also have the oh, well, we're primaries because we're domestically entangled or financially entangled or we have kids or whatnot. And I've seen those situations be just as toxic as monogamous situations because basically you're limiting relationships with other people in terms of friendships and familial relationships. And I think that those are just as important as a relationship. We have kind of a weird situation in this group. I feel like we're all on an equal playing field. I feel like, you know, time that we spend with everybody I don't know how to say this. Do you know what I'm getting at? Can somebody help me here? That that my relationship with Eric is respected just as much as my relationship with Max is respected just as much as my friendship with Hannah is. Mm. That there's no person in charge, really. Except for me. Except for you. <laughs> You're the captain there's of the no, ship. <laughs> no like, built-in hierarchy right. for us, which I, I do think is different than a mm-hmm. lot of the ways, you know, and but it's also, again, one of those things we've grown in. This yes. has not always been yeah. the case. Yeah, it's. I think it's a lot like that because of the work you guys have done, not because mm. it's just what it was. No, no. Well, you know, Eric, I know you haven't seen as many examples. Oh, of... but I've seen a few examples of hierarchies that were kind of twisted. Okay, well, you know, can you can you share that? Because I think I think that when we talk about the things that happen in toxic monogamy. We are, those are also applicable to polyamory. Yeah, if I'm going the off same topic, dynamics. please read. No, yeah. those are, they're the exact same dynamic. It's a relationship between two people. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and as long as we're sort of waffling around about this, <laughs> you know, at least for myself as a peace of mind thing, as a disclaimer, you know, we know a lot of people who are what I have always called polyamory evangelists. Mm-hmm. And you touched it a little bit a few minutes ago, but I just want to say, like, 
Polyamory is a relationship style. It is no more or less valid than any other relationship style. Correct. Nor and is it specifically defined in any way. Right. There are many, 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 many different right. versions. Right. Of right. It. Everybody right. like means something right. else by it when they say it. And a lot of the things that people cite, these statistics about X number of civilizations through time have practiced some form of, aren't really true. Yeah. You know, they're sort of like anthropological. It's uh, it's conjecture. Yeah. It's all conjecture. I yeah. think I think that we we take the small number of facts that we have and we really twist them to to meet what we think society right. should look like and we always want to support what we're doing. Right. Yeah. And um as just a, as a species, you know, we always want to go like, well, the data says and this supports <laughs> me because and you know, I've mentioned in previous episode that like the people who are big proponents of sex at dawn and even, you know, even listening to Dan Savage earlier he was talking about how like, we're just not genetically designed to be monogamous. Okay, yeah, maybe, but it's still a valid choice. Yeah. And you can do it in a way that is consensual and respectful and has healthy boundaries and healthy attachment styles. Yeah, I was he- laughing about this the other day because I, I'm in a unnatural parenting group on Facebook. Um, and they had posted some... Unnatural A parent? natural a parenting. Natural. Yes. Oh, I thought you said <laughs> an unnatural <laughs> parenting. Like an unnatural parenting. It's, well, it's no, real but that- Dr. Moreau over there. <laughs> A natural parenting Facebook group. And they had posted a study that had been done um, that was saying that, you know, our ancestors historically breastfed children until six years old regularly as like a justification for why all parents now should do the same thing that this study was showing had historically been done. And I was thinking about our conversations about sex at dawn and all of that as like a justification or an a reason to advocate doing mm-hmm. this for all people. It just doesn't mm-hmm. make sense. We're not those people. We're not in those mostly desperate and awful circumstances <laughs> yeah. that yeah. resulted in those behaviors. Yeah, it I doesn't mean, make sense. And you, that's and you what know society that, is. And you know that 87.3% of all statistics are made up on the spot. I heard it was 57.3. <laughs> <laughs> You're both wrong. It's 66.8. Um, so, uh, or is and it 69? This ah. is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh. So this is a thing that <laughs> Hannah, I I think you and I talked about it at one point. The fact that a lot of today's culture is based in this desperate time, is based in this need to defend the th- small things that you have because you don't have a very big patch of the world and you have to fight for it constantly. We don't live in a world where we have to fight for that. Yes, there are some third world nations that don't have access to resources and goods and so forth. But as a whole, sitting here in this living room, I don't have to defend my living room. I don't need to marry somebody to protect my name or my progeny or what have you. I'm not trying to keep riches in the family. Mm -hmm. And monogamy and the religious things behind it, all of that were designed to control culture, right? Yeah. We can agree on that. Yeah. So, so we don't need that stuff today. So now I feel like it's kind of a free for all. We can do whatever the <laughs> fuck we want yeah. to um because there's nothing there's no there's no ethically superior way of having a relationship with somebody. So long as you're not abusing them and it's based in consent and mutual respect, that's the right thing to do for you. Yeah, absolutely. At that time. I think we're all in this room. Nobody's going to fight you on that. <laughs> well, and I think, but I think that the people who have to look back at statistics and pulling it, they're trying to, they're trying to defend something they don't need to defend. If you make a choice and you're not hurting anybody, then shut the fuck up about it. Just go be yourself and live your life. <laughs> like, I, you I know. don't feel the need to be more yeah. realistic about well, any yeah. of that. Yeah, you know, I don't know who I'm defending here, but <laughs> like, we, like, but we do like, you know, we live in a, a society in a time where, Everybody feels embattled, and everybody is claiming to be the most oppressed group. Yeah. So everybody has to come up with some sort of justification well, for I'm how they go feel, ahead what they want to do, what they think, whatever. I'm I'm going to go ahead and say that I have faced oppression in my life, but I have lived a very, very privileged life. Yes. All of us in this room have lived very, very privileged lives. We come from a place of privilege. So, I, I mean... If for me to get on my on my high horse about like, well, you nobody's know, disagreeing with you. I know, <laughs> I know, nobody's disagreeing with me. I'm just saying, like I, the the people that I see who are still in who are in similar situations as us, who get very defensive about, well, here are the statistics and here's yeah. all the data that I need to use to back up, and here are the books you should read that prove why I'm right. Like, why does it matter to be right? Like, it doesn't. So anyway, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. <laughs> well, to <laughs> sum that up, I just. Yeah, I'm doing this because this is what I like. Yeah. So I'm doing you because I like you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's the whole <laughs> point. So I guess all that to say, when we talk about toxic monogamy, just as like we're definitely going to you know talk about 
toxic masculinity. Yeah. That's not saying that monogamy is toxic in and of itself. Right. And it's not saying that toxic relationships are confined to monogamy. It's saying that the, this is the culture that we're within. Here are the problems and we've opted out. Yeah. Or at least we're attempting to opt <gasps> out of most of those things. Trying. Yeah. What are some what are some other identifiers of a toxic monogamous relationship? A belief that your romantic partner needs to fulfill every single emotional, social, and physical need that you have. Oh. <laughs> well, as somebody who's dated everybody else in the room, um, <laughs> I'm going to have to go ahead and say that that's never been true for me in any polyamorous or monogamous relationship. I've never found somebody who was my end-all be-all. I don't believe it exists. I have deluded myself into thinking that. And how did that work out for you? Well, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> but no, what, what is because of the societal pressures of all of these sorts of things, you know, you meet a person, you click with them a while, and mm -hmm. and you are, uh, I won't keep saying you, I'll say me, or one, can um, overlook all of the deficiencies and the, the, the non-compatible variables and those sorts of things to convince oneself that you have found an end-all be-all. Mm. Yeah. Well, fre frequently that's what new relationship energy is all about, right? Yes, exactly. Yes. You know, when you meet somebody that you're excited about and you are, as you say, like clicking with them on a on a really serious level, like mm -hmm. at first it does seem like, oh, like they're amazing. They think all my jokes are funny. <laughs> like they agree with me on all of my uh, political stuff. Like there's nothing to fight about in a relationship for the first three months, right? Right. Well, in my experience, three months has been the honeymoon period. Sure. But also, um, it's been studied and the chemical reactions that happen in the body as part of new relationship energy uh, have been shown to happen up to two or three years into a relationship, depending on the relationship and how it's fed and how that oxytocin button is pushed. So, I mean, really, until you're with somebody for like five years – you don't know if you really like them or if your body just wants to fuck them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I think a lot of having non-monogamous relationships is about the fact that we get to extend the period of new mm -hmm. relationship energy. Mm -hmm. It's like skipping stones. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, for the most part, most of us, except for people who like hardcore practice solo polyamory, have a nesting partner or in my new case have like two domestic partners <laughs> and anybody else we date on the outside is somebody we see once a week a couple times a month whatever it is mm -hmm. and like you just don't develop the things to have serious conflict about right as long as it's just somebody that you get to go have a nice time with every once in a while right and uh for anybody who hasn't checked out previous episodes and this is your first time coming in i'm married to max i live with hannah as well Max and Hannah and I live together, and Eric is my partner who lives across town. And so, and Eric and I have talked about the fact that if, you know, that we would probably have conflict if we lived together. Most that, likely. That yeah. it's a really good thing that we don't live together, that it's a it's a boon in our relationship because yeah. there are... I get real boring real fast. Yeah. So <laughs> well, I get to see the exciting parts. <laughs> I mean, you know, Chastin, you and I, in the first couple of years that we were dating, didn't really have conflict. It wasn't until the period where we were moving towards living together, having a serious, serious forever commitment that we started having like serious angry at each other conflicts over real life issues. Well, I think it was you and I didn't start having conflict until it was important. So yes, I would agree with that. Yeah, that's um, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, and that came down to things like, you know, do we have the same values? Is this the relationship we really want? You know, and I think you and I, and we've talked in previous episodes about sort of our fucked up journey together. I think that you and I grew up a whole lot and we were just two dumb kids sort of duking it out to very stubborn people to probably not neurotypical people. No, yeah. I don't believe that for a second. Don't believe what? <laughs> that the both of you were just Neuro stubborn and, and yeah. Are you being sarcastic right now? I can't tell. Only slightly. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Okay. I really leaned heavily on this point whenever I was a little baby polyam 
person Aww. and trying to explain to my family what was going on. And I was like, I'm just, I'm just too loving and too big hearted to be contained. You know, I was like, I was like, like, no one person can be responsible for all of my emotions. And w- all of which is true, but neglects the point that we were just talking about, yeah. which is the opposite of toxic monogamy yeah. is not polyamory. No. The opposite is a healthy relationship mm-hmm. that has good boundaries mm-hmm. in it. And so their response, which was very reasonable, was like, well, you can have friends, <laughs> you know? And you, can. you don't have to lean entirely on your romantic partnerships, which is also true. It's very true. It is very true. And I think, and I've talked about this prior, that it, it, it wasn't until I had a good, solid friend support network mm-hmm. that I started feeling healthier in my relationships because I wasn't leaning on my partner all the time. And, uh, you know... I have a lot of emotions too, Hannah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of me to contain and right. one person just can't deal with that. I agree with that. <laughs> I think that there's a, a there's a fallacy, I'll call it a fallacy, that comes about with polyamory where it's the, well, one person can't meet your needs, so you find the other people to meet your needs. And that's not about that. There's no there's no thing that Max does that fills holes that Eric doesn't do, and there's no thing vice versa. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure Eric right, is filling. Well, jokes aside. Eric is Eric is definitely filling some holes that Max isn't, but uh, <laughs> but but there, you know, there you two are actually very complimentary in terms of personality. And, uh, it's an audible blush now. <laughs> and you two are actually very complimentary in terms of um, skill sets and outlooks on life, and you know, just the the life that you're living right now. You're both blue collar. You're both kind of weirdos. You know, there are a lot of similarities. So we have types, right? Like we're always going to look for similar I have a people, type. you know. Yeah. It my my type is is weirdo nerds. Like all all of you are just fucking weirdos. I love you, but <laughs> you're so bit. weird. Yeah, a little bit. But like, you're all very cute, like so, so <laughs> you're like it's like so weird. It's like it's like so weird. Mr. Kata. Sorry. <laughs> well, and that that uh that sort of sentiment is the thing that in our uh in our our polyam facebook groups is memed right like these things about like there's just so much love to give i think that still leans on like the puzzle piece theory like some of us are really dumb boring puzzle pieces who just need one thing to complete them and some of us are super complex difficult puzzle pieces that need a dozen people to complete them Mm. when the whole point is nobody's here to complete anybody i'm a i'm a thousand piece puzzle of just a clear blue sky with no clouds (laughs) And I, I, I don't need that much to complete me. Now. You're, you're one of those <laughs> I complete pu- myself. Thousand piece puzzles that you put together and then you lay the image on over it when you're done. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. I'm just blank puzzle pieces. If you're enjoying the Pod Pod Cult Cast, check out our podcast show notes at podpodcultcast.com, or keep up with us on Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook at Pod Pod Cult Cast, and Instagram at Cult with a V. Love us. Rate us on Apple Podcasts, or help us continue to make this podcast possible by becoming a patron. Head to patreon.com slash podpodcultcast. Remember, that's cult with a V. Patrons get access to exclusive content like our Cultcast Media Club. This month, we're talking about Paris is Burning, the Vagina Bible, and the musician Lizzo. Thank you so much to our patrons, Jenny, Sydney, and Kate. has helped me through the things that I feel come up in toxic monogamy. You know, we talk about jealousy and we talk about lack of boundaries, boundaries and codependency. The thing that's helped me is learning to love myself and learning to like spending time with myself and engaging in self-care and realizing like, hey, if <laughs> if my partner's not doing something for me, what is it that I need? Why do I think I need it from them? And can I engage them in a way that asks for their consent to do this? Or can I just take care of it myself? And there are a lot of things I can just take care of myself. Uh-huh. And there are, are some things I can't take. Again, or? Uh, yeah. There are some things I can't do myself. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How about this one? Toxic monogamy is believing that sufficiently passionate and true love 
will always overcome practical incompatibilities. So the idea that if it's if it takes work at all, if it's too complicated and it's too hard, then it's not real love. Almost the opposite of that. Is that is that, am I right in because rephrasing? it's true love? These things don't really actually matter. When a lot of times they do. Ooh, it's a double edged sword, right? Mm. Yes, like it that, is. Isn't it? Mm. Either your love's not true enough, or mm. our problems aren't real. We'll just love them out. I don't think you can love out a problem. Love no, doesn't debt, fix anything. That's a motherfucker, and that's still <laughs> there whether you love each other or not. That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need to handle that shit. Yeah. Um, gosh. I I have a firm belief that in a relationship, it's always going to require work. Sometimes that work feels like work, and sometimes that work feels like fun. And I don't think that my love can fix stuff. I mean... Nor is it supposed to. N- I guess not, but... Uh, but we're all kind of taught that. That's a very... I mean, I like you an awful thing. lot, but if there are fucked up things, like, we're going to have to work that out, right? Right. Right. Are you saying love does not conquer all? No, love doesn't conquer all. I think that's a... But it's a real nice thing on a bumper sticker. Or whatever. <laughs> it sounds uh, great. I think that love love facilitates the desire to want to work on it. The desire to go through what... Um, are you guys familiar with the phrase growth frustration? Tell us. Yeah, so, when I was 13. So, yeah. <laughs> so growth frustration. So anytime you learn a new skill... Growth frustration is the practice time. So, you know, say you're... It's the montage in an 80s movie. Exactly, it is. It's the montage in an 80s movie. So, um, you know, Eric, you play the violin. You had to practice day in and day out to get to a place where you were, you felt confident and and where it was second nature. But that practice is boring. It's boring learning yeah, how to play I an instrument. Yeah, I I would have been a much better yeah. violinist if I actually practiced yeah and it, it, so growth frustration is this is this feeling that you get when like yeah i know the steps i'm doing the steps over and over again but it's still not coming naturally and i'm not where i want to be with it but i'm also not at the beginning i know a little bit about it so i think that the same is true of relationships like there are things that you learn about the other person that require that sometimes it's just some pouring shit that you have to get through like and the whole love conquers all trope I think mm, kind of implies that if it is that kind of work, well, then it's not love or on the other side of that, it's the opposite. It's well, it's because there is work. Yeah. Yeah. It's not love. Yeah. And, and maybe because things don't always work out, that's taken as a sign that it was never real to begin with, which I think is really damaging. All relationships end. All relationships end. Everything. Wasn't it this morning? So, um, the three of us, Max, Hannah, and I, we ate breakfast outside. Weren't we sitting outside drinking coffee and talking about rejection this morning? Yeah. Yeah, we were like talking what about... What does it take to be resilient to rejection? Exactly. How people socialized away from it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, way, what it takes to be resilient to it is to be rejected. Yeah. It's, over and over you and over. Practice. practice that You have too. to fail to yeah. change and grow. Like, failure is the opportunity for change. But we were talking about that, especially in the context of toxic um, masculinity, because mm-hmm. I think we're... We're socializing, you know, half of all of the people to say that, you know, rejection says something about you as a human being. It, it makes you a bad person or reveals your badness mm. when that's just not the case. Yeah, it has nothing to do with you. Uh, I'm going to now reference the four agreements for this episode. <laughs> I'll try to do so once every episode. The four agreements, um, don't take it personally. Don't make assumptions. Uh, always do your best and be impeccable with your word. If you're not taking it personally and realizing that it's not about you, it's so much easier to live your life. Max, you look like you've been doing some work over there. What you got for us? Uh, I'm going to throw a curveball or a monkey wrench in because we keep talking about these things in this framework of this word love. Mm. We're not, but we're not talking about the word love. And That's true. there's a thing that, you know, crosses uh, various platforms every once in a while that crossed uh, something I was reading yesterday. And, that is the seven kinds of love according to the ancient Greeks. Oh, right. So there's, and, uh, yeah. You know, I'm not real smart, so I'm not going to try a couple of these words. But uh, eros, the like sexual love, mm-hmm. uh, philia, which is like brotherly love, mm-hmm. you know, strong friendship. Uh, you've got uh, ludus, I guess, playful love. Yeah. Uh, pragma, under long lasting love. Agape, love of the soul, which is strongly associated with religion. And, I believe that's and the love today what they called vibes. 
<laughs> yeah, positive, positive vibe only. Or non. The love of the self, which we've been talking about filling our own holes. And, <laughs> I like to fill my holes. And and parental love, the love of the child. Yeah. While that does a little bit better job, we're still not talking about what this word love is. Well, Max, what does love mean to you when the concept of love, the feeling of love, describe what love is for you? Well, as a de- deeply broken person who can't just, like, who has to overthink every goddamn thing, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. I really don't know. Is it a force? Is it a, a emotion? Is it something bigger outside of ourselves that floods us and then flows outwards. I, I really don't I really don't know. I mean I know that I mean it deeply when I say I love you, Chastin. Mm-hmm. I love you, Hannah. I love my sister. I love our kid. But I don't know is it is it just chemicals? You know? Like yeah, it's it's, it's really and that, that sucks, dude. Like I, I wish I could be a person who who just, you know, who didn't think about it. Who, but I do. I do think about those things. I think about where it comes from. I think about what it means. I think about what it means to have it for another person or have it for yourself or to have it for the Detroit Tigers. You know, I, I, <laughs> Roy, like it's 84. Um, <laughs> Bless you, boys. <laughs> so. Jumping in. You're taking too long. No, there's a oh! book. Okay, so there's a book I've talked about before called How Emotions Are Made. And it talks about how experiences when we're younger and the enculturation we experience as children growing up in a Western society, all that stuff helps us come up with concepts of emotion and what emotion means. And so that things like what anger is and what sadness is and what love is are concepts formed by society and sort of given to us. And I think that chemically, I think that when you have new relationship energy, it is your brain trying to establish a new pattern of being and a new way of thinking about somebody. So when you love somebody and you love somebody long-term, and that oxytocin isn't releasing anymore, the brain is still remembering those patterns of behavior from when there was a lot of oxytocin and when you did feel really awesome and there was excitement and everything they did was great. So I have a very cynical idea of love. I think love is a chemical reaction. And then I think after that chemical reaction goes away, love is a habit that we have built through work and time. I struggle to feel love 100% of the time. And that could be because I'm autistic. It could be because I have a really fucked up past. Do you mean specifically you struggle to feel love from other people? Yes. Or for other people? From Not for, other people. from other people. Okay. I don't, I, I, I know that my son loves me, but I can't feel that. Well, that, I mean, that's particularly difficult with children. Yes, it children is. Children are children. But, I, but I've never been able to feel his expressions of love. I apologize. I don't know why that's so emotional. Um, well, are you kidding? It is. <laughs> of like, course that's, that's emotional. Yeah, uh, if you were to say that without emotion, <laughs> yeah, that would be kind <laughs> of fucked up. would be like a fucking psychopath. <laughs> so, so, you know, I know everybody in this room loves me and in their own ways, but there are very specific things that I have to hear in order re- to reinforce the idea that I'm not just lying to myself about that. Because all my life I grew up with this idea that I was not lovable, and that comes from a completely different place, and that comes from trauma and abuse and self-esteem issues that result from that. Um, so love is a very complicated thing that I have a lot of trouble feeling, and when I speak openly and honestly about this with people, it freaks them out because they're like, oh my god, you can't feel love. Like, what's wrong with you? And I don't think anything's wrong with me. I think I just don't understand what it's supposed to feel like. I know that I love. I know that I have love for other people. I have compassion and caring. And when they're hurt, I feel hurt. When they're happy, I feel joyous. I can feel all those things. But but I struggle to feel this return sort of warm, fuzzy feeling. That just doesn't happen in my body. Um, I get feelings of love from physical contact. I get feelings of love from praise. But those are feelings of love from me loving the other person, not me feeling love from them. It's just sort of like a, okay, it's still okay to love them. It's still okay to be vulnerable because mm-hmm. they're doing all the things right, I guess, if that makes sense. I don't know. I it, feel like a ninny. I don't like it, it when I cry suddenly. It kind of does. Not that it doesn't make sense. It does make sense. Okay. Um, but it's also not at all how I think about it. And in a very, very broad sense, Mm -hmm. what I would say is that, um, and and also glossing over all of the things that you've tried to intellectualize, Max, (laughs) (laughs) not that you can't, I just mean you listed off a bunch of things and said yourself that you don't fully understand them in a very overly simplistic way. Lover is, is the, 
basically just the things that make me feel gratitude. Hmm. Um, whether that's outward or inward or reciprocated even. It's the things that I'm like, ah, no, that's pretty awesome. I'm glad that's a thing. Hmm. Okay. I can see that. I identify with that. I feel like um, the people that I've had love for have all been people that I find value. I believe that they are worthy, worthy of my time, worthy of my energy, worthy of my devotion. Mm -hmm. Um, And that for me has felt like a really solid, like tangible thing. Whereas sometimes the the butterflies and the emotions didn't come readily um, or, you know, weren't consistent. Mm -hmm. But I always felt like, oh, this is really solid because I see what this person is working towards and their goals in, in life and their motivations and and I vibe with that. <laughs> which type of love with that was that? Positive which which Greek only. word was that one? <laughs> Agape. Agape is a Agape. positive vibe. I yes. love tequila. <laughs> <laughs> That's agave. agave. <laughs> <clears throat> well, maybe we can well, pull up. That's officially off the rails. <laughs> You're welcome. If we're trying to define love or, or that solid footing for the relationship, um, I found another list. I love my lists. <laughs> I like your list too. Basic rights in a relationship. And obviously oh, yeah, like listing out rights is a very baseline like level oh. of what you should expect, not necessarily what we think of as love. But I, when I read through this, I felt like it provided that groundwork, right? The, the level of security we need in relationships to then feel the feelings and have the emotions that we want to have. Hmm. So according to this, and maybe y'all would have some disagreements or some clarifications on any of these, um, but the list that I found said the basic rights in a relationship are the right to receive goodwill from the other person, the right to receive emotional support, to be heard by the other and the right to be responded to with courtesy, the right to have your own view even if your partner has a different one, to have your feelings and experiences acknowledged as real, to have a sincere apology for any jokes you feel are offensive, to have clear, informative answers to questions that concern what is legitimately your business, the right to live free from accusation and blame, the right to live free from criticism and judgment, To have your work and your interests spoken of with respect. The right to receive encouragement. To live free from emotional and physical threat. To live free from angry outbursts and rage. To be called by no name that devalues you. And the right to be asked respectfully rather than to be ordered. Hmm. I thought that was pretty comprehensive. It is, and I would agree with nearly all of it. Except? Except. Um... Live free from criticism and judgment, that sort of mm. thing. I, I judge the fuck out of you. <laughs> but no, what well, in in a realistic nature, to have a good and healthy relationship, somebody's going to have to, every once in a while, call you on your shit. And yeah. this kind of implies that that shouldn't be part of it. I, I think it's just the way they're using mm. the word criticism. Mm. Well, it wasn't just that one. Um, earlier <laughs> oh, on the list, it was, it was a similar sort of thing. Uh, which one was it? I, I actually don't see it now. Um, but basically, it was it was kind of a the tone of that list is a oh well no 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 you're 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 good nobody should really question that yeah. you have a right to have that self described yeah. uh, I don't know identity on on who you are in this relationship and nobody should touch that oh i saw a video this week where a speaker was using the the word contention to describe a really healthy relationship where people build each other up and challenge each other Mm -hmm. and i think the point was really good but all of the comments were just picking on the word contention because Mm -hmm. nobody wants to be in a contentious relationship right i think we have the same connotations with criticism that criticism is negative um and about tearing people down whereas you know i really thrive on critical feedback i'm positive you know I, I yeah i think i think the ability to take feedback and also to give constructive feedback those are skills that you have to develop those aren't things that come naturally and i think that there are times in relationships when we need to offer some constructive feedback because if we see an issue we should be able to speak to our feelings on the issue mm-hmm. and and talk about it it doesn't have to be like well you suck <laughs> it can be like you know hey well, here's some... also a thing called tact <laughs> yeah yeah so you have to have tact um 
in keeping in our with our theme of lists, our Patreon supporter Kate, thank you so much, Kate, just sent me a text message with this uh, article. It's called "Committed to You on Fluidity in Relationships" from MindCrush.com, and it has three principles that it's really talking about. Um, the first one is that feelings don't require getting; it's okay to want. Just because you have the feeling doesn't mean you get the response to it or what have you. Um, compatibility is complex. Don't take it personally if you're not compatible. And relationships are a team sport. By definition, uh, they can't be more than any one person desires. That's valid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that goes back to what we're talking about with rejection. Yeah. yeah exactly. that it's so hard not to hear rejection and say, oh, well, what I wanted in the first place was wrong. And if I want to hear yes next time, which would make me feel good, then I have to change what I, my expectations right. are um, instead of, you know. I think working that, with hope that, that you'll find what you actually need. Yeah. I think that culturally we really, um, take issue with people changing their minds. Mm -hmm. You know, consent is not a blanket consent thing. We can decide that we don't like something or something is not for us. And, you know, there have been situations where I've been involved with somebody and I was really, really into them. And then I go, you know what? This is not what I want. And I've gone, okay. Gonna, you know, this is, this has to come to an end now. I no longer feel like being part of this relationship. I'm done with this relationship. I don't consent to being part of this relationship anymore. And that person comes back and says, like, but you told me you loved me. Yeah. That yeah, doesn't but, have anything to do with how I feel now. Yeah, that's the hardest part about any breakup, about being on the other end of any breakup, right. is going like, well, yesterday everything was fine. Well, typically, yesterday everything wasn't fine. Yeah, typically, it just wasn't yesterday happening. there was something we just weren't like making a big deal out exactly. of it. Exactly, <laughs> uh, Hannah, you said something uh, when the last time we were we were talking about your story coming up through polyamory. Mm -hmm. You said that you know there were all these problems, and I was just quiet about it. And because I was quiet about it, they didn't exist for other people. And then when I stopped being quiet about the issues I was having. It was like a sudden new surprising thing for everyone, yeah. but it wasn't new and surprising for me. It was new and surprising for them because they hadn't heard it before. And I think that happens a lot in relationships. Yes, we let things fester and we don't talk about things because conflict no, is hard. Easier that way. Yeah. Status quo. Yeah. And just because I'm having all of this internal conflict and know that things have to change eventually doesn't mean that I'm ready to admit that all of this was a lie and I never had true love. Yeah. You know, because we're still living in that false dichotomy that says, hey, if this didn't last forever, then I guess they just weren't the one. Mm -hmm. My love was somehow flawed. I don't believe in the one. There yeah, is no one. Yeah, it shouldn't be looked at as flawed or failure. It's yeah. just that time has run its well, course. Every every relationship ends, be it through mutual decision, the decision of one party, or through death, <laughs> or other means. Um, and I think that going into relationships with the idea that, okay, this can end someday. How can I make it end in a healthy way? How can I leave this person better than I found them? How can I, you know, work on myself so that I leave better than they found me? Yeah. What, what a wonderful thought. Because I feel like so many times we're in situations that are painful for everyone. Yes. And it seems like the only possibility is to just burn that bridge. So then we won't have to suffer doubt. It'll just be destroyed. Mm -hmm. Just burn it to the ground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then there won't be anything left to pine for when we could be finding the way that, yes, that builds each other up. being angry about it is so much healthier. <laughs> Definitely. And there's also a thing that happens when two people end a relationship. The person who ends the relationship and makes that decision to pull the plug suffers just as much as the other person. Yeah. That person has agonized over that decision. That that person still is going to miss the person they're breaking up with. They're still going to they still have feelings. Feelings are we're not faucets. We don't just turn our feelings off. You know, I can love somebody very very much and recognize that it's just not right for me to be with them. Yeah, actually the uh the end of my my last monogamous relationship kind of had a bit of that to it. And that is because I had to go back and and pick up all of my stuff like a couple of months mm. later. Yeah. And uh when I was there she she actually she thanked me because she was like I I really didn't know what to expect when you were coming back here and uh you were this was so much easier than what I expected. Mm. Thank you. And it was just because in the time that I had moved away and was waiting on my stuff I was like, "Oh, you know what? You I she was right. I get it." I also see everything that she was, you know, the kind of emotional gymnastics she was going through to be able to be the one that honestly was the stronger one to say, hey, this is, you know, we're kind of done here. 
and uh, and the only reason that it hadn't happened sooner was because neither one of us had really been strong enough to say, but to call a spade a spade. Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I feel like we don't always have that opportunity to sort of reflect on what happened and then come back and have that closure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Hannah, you and I have had exactly that, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, you and I dated for six months, and I ended the relationship. And you and I live together now, and we're really good friends, and I enjoy spending m- most of my time with you. And um, and we have gone back and had those circle back kind of difficult conversations about, like, look, this is where I was, and this is where you were, and I could see this, and this was hard at the time, and yeah. here are the feelings I have, and here are the feelings that I don't have anymore, and yada, yada, yada. And I feel like that you and I have done a good job of being able to reflect on it in a healthy way. And that could just be me. I could be making all this up. No, I don't know. <laughs> I absolutely agree. I don't know if that would have been possible if um, if you hadn't been able to say, hey, we need to put a freeze on this right now. Yeah. And step back because um, I just didn't have the, the tools at yeah. that time to say stepping back from something and having less intimacy and less conversation about it can be a good thing mm-hmm. and can save our friendship if we let it. Mm-hmm. Um, that wasn't where I was at the time. And so, yeah consider that a really big blessing yeah it's a skill set that i'm trying to build you know whether on it's on the you know the relationship scale or just the individual conversation Mm -hmm. to be able to say hey what if we took that moment had a reflective period and then came back whenever we were better equipped to yeah you know to work through it yeah hey max hi how you doing over there good (laughs) what are you thinking about nothing do we have another bullet point yes i mean we couldn't go through the whole conversation on toxic monogamy and not talk about jealousy. Oh. <laughs> the mm. belief that jealousy and possessiveness are an indicator of love. Here's my big confession of the episode. Max, it, for the longest time, would bother me that I would have all of these feelings of possessiveness and all of these insecurities and things like that about you being with other people, but you didn't seem to have those on the flip side at all. And I know that you did, um, but it seemed like, you know, but but he's just not jealous about me. And, and this is yeah. something that, you know, culture has told me like, oh, well, if you're not, if you don't, if you don't feel possessive, you don't feel jealousy, then it's not love. Well, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, that was exactly what I was thinking of reading this bullet point was mm-hmm. that that is just programming. Yeah. That is just what we see in, in TV shows and movies and stuff. And that we are led to believe that we are supposed to be jealous. We are supposed to be possessive. And if our partner is not jealous and possessive over us, they don't care. Then they're jealous and possessive over somebody else. Oh, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Exactly. They're not scared of losing you. Then you're not their real treasure. Right. Yeah. yeah. Better. 100% that. <laughs> yeah, that's a great way of putting that. Yeah. So, and and I am as guilty of this as at least any other dude, probably at least as any other person as a what a uh, 15 to 24 year old where yeah it, it, treasure is a great word where yeah. you know you 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 got your little treasure you want to lock it away in a box mm-hmm. where nobody else mm-hmm. can get to it because somebody else is going to get to it yep mm-hmm. yep i have that t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah and i think that that it goes both ways. It goes both ways that, like, we are taught that we're supposed to be that way over a partner. But they're also supposed to be that way about us. And they're supposed to be that way over us. Right. So right. in some ways, I think that, and maybe I'm just justifying my behavior and justifying my emotions, <laughs> but in some ways, I think that occasionally in relationships, I was acting out a role. Mm-hmm. I was acting out a role as the possessive boyfriend when... Like, because that's the model that we have. Right. That's the model that every romantic comedy, that every, you know, SNL sketch about relationships, that every article, that every Cosmo quiz has. It's all about, like, are they possessive of you? Do they care enough to... And to come home again to talk about masculinity. Right. Also that you're, you know, a caveman dragging her home by her hair. Mm-hmm. And you're well, not a real and man. And toxic femininity yeah. is you know, you're not a real woman unless you let them. Right. <laughs> How has jealousy played a role in your relationships, Hannah? Um, my first few relationships, I was really possessive of, of people's time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was definitely like the kind of girlfriend who always expected the immediate text back. I was in relationships where we would talk on the phone, like from the time I got off from work until I fell asleep at night, like oh multiple gosh. nights. It was obnoxious. Oh. The worst. <laughs> oh, the worst. Yeah. 
And so that was kind of a standard that I held for like whether or not someone was paying me sufficient attention. So the culture <laughs> shock <laughs> moving to Polyam was, uh, has been interesting. Um, but I do feel like I just kind of flipped that. And then I was like, oh, well, I don't experience feelings of jealousy anymore. So that makes me morally superior to those who do, <laughs> right? I've conquered this in my life, completely missing the point that jealousy is not about being right or wrong or bad or good. Mm -mm. It's just the way that I'm feeling that's mm -hmm. probably trying to tell me something. So I probably shouldn't just like stuff it and not talk about it. Yeah, jealousy is sort of that like, hey, you've got some stuff going on. Just look at it. This is the feeling you're going to have. And this is what you need to look. It's like right. this little it's a cue for self-examination. Yeah, so that's if I'm just always giving into it. Yeah, that's not how I ever interpret it. <laughs> really? How has jealousy played a role in your relationships? Well, no, in the most toxic of ways. Um, well, do tell. I may have inadvertent. Well, or, <laughs> I may have caused a guy to move out of his apartment because I was <laughs> a little overprotective of him talking to a mm. chick that I was dating for a long time. Okay. I did creepy things. Okay. I left it. I left a note. A creepy note. It was a creepy note. <laughs> a creepy, you better find another place to live note? No. Okay. <laughs> no, no. I don't know. It sounds kind of like that's what the note said. No. It was <laughs> just like a, hey, uh, I don't like what you're doing kind of thing. Oh. And it was because of the note that he moved out. Mm. Are you sure he moved out because of the note? Did he say that? A word got back to me. <laughs> I see. <laughs> Well, I guess this is my conversation to, to nitpick on words. Uh, one of the things that we talk a lot about in our our superiority as, as non-monogamous people <laughs> is that jealousy isn't jealousy, right? Like jealousy it's is It's an umbrella term of, for insecurity or right. other emotions. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, that's really what it boils down to. Yeah. I am a very jealous person. I'm an extremely jealous, extremely possessive person. But I try to act on those feelings in healthy ways and recognize that those feelings come from past experiences that have nothing to do with the present. I call them historical thoughts, historical feelings. When I feel insecure in a relationship and start having like, well, why are they getting this and I'm not? Uh, those usually come, it usually boils down to, I have a need that I'm not expressing and I need to express that need and see if my partner consents to it. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. I think I tend to be less. Anyway, at this point, as a 41-year-old, like, <laughs> old man, I think I tend to be less jealous and more envious. Mm -hmm. I tend to envy what other people have or what other people are getting and less jealous over someone else's, over a partner, over a friend, right. over whatever, yes, and that is over an their important, behavior. important distinction. It yeah. is. Mm -hmm. With your <laughs> cat ears, you look like one of those clocks, you know, the, the clocks where the cat's eyes go back and forth. <laughs> Tail is the yeah. pendulum. So to, to sum this one up, Toxic Monogamy says, if you truly love someone, you will never be attracted to anyone else. The relationship always comes first. Romantic partner needs to fulfill every single emotional, social, and physical need that you have. Sufficiently passionate and true love will always overcome practical incompatibilities. Jealousy and possessiveness are an indicator of love all based on love as a zero-sum game. Which it is not. Which it is not. Um, so, you know, I've been sitting here thinking, like, what's the cure? What's mm. the cure for toxic monogamy? I mean, obviously a cultural shift has to change, but I think that right now we have sort of the wellness movement and the self-care movement, and people are looking at emotions and looking mm. at their ownership of their own emotions and relationships more than – and it's more talked about regularly, I think, than it used to be. For me, the th like being able to set healthy boundaries, being able to identify that jealousy is a feeling within me and not a thing happening to me, not something somebody is doing to me, and engaging in obtaining consent in relationships, enthusiastic mm -hmm. consent. Um, if, if I ask for something, it's, it's always okay for me to ask for whatever I need. I'm not owed that. I deserve anything, but I'm not owed anything, if that makes sense. So if I want something, I should ask for it. And that person gets to decide whether or not they can consent to give it to me. And then if they can't give it to me, I get to con decide whether I consent to continue with the relationship at that level. Like It seems really common sense to me on paper, but it's not so easily lived. 
but it's not easily lived because of the patterns of communication that I've had been bred into me. Yeah, it doesn't feel simple. Right. It sounds simple whenever you lay it out that way. But the bottom line is you always have a choice. You don't always get what you want, but you always have a choice. And other people's choices don't necessarily have anything to do with you. Are you saying don't take it personally? I'm saying don't take it personally, (laughs) which is like the third agreement or the second agreement. I don't know. It's one of the four agreements. Please read the (laughs) agreement. Look for Chaston's new podcast, The Four Agreements. She's just going to read the four agreements over and over again. But I'll read it in a sensual, quiet, sexy voice. Good. (laughs) (laughs) Polyamory is not the solution to monogamy. Or it's not the solution to toxic monogamy. The solution to toxic monogamy is having a healthy relationship with boundaries that is, um, is You're making a gesture like mutually consensual. <laughs> yes, mutually consensual, based in consent. Yeah, yeah. And a big part of having healthy relationships is having a healthy relationship with yourself. Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's absolutely having a healthy relationship with yourself, which I think we'll we'll probably touch on in our next episode. We, you know, our first couple of episodes, we were really talking about who we are as people and how we got to where we are as a family, and now we're sort of, I think, shifting into a a place of discussing emotional wellness and relationship health. Yeah, I think that's where we're going. Yeah. So, are we wrapping this one up? Does anybody else have anything else to say? No. No. Everybody good? Uh, I I have to. I have to do a correction. I feel okay. really bad about it. Okay. It's a correction from our um from our release day Q and A. Okay. Sydney is not the capital of Australia. Canberra is the capital of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but to our friend in Sydney, I say Canberra can suck it. But Sydney our, fucking rules. But dog. our friend is not in Sydney. Our friend is in Oxford, yeah, and his name is Sydney. Right. I do have that right. No, and no. Sydney, it Sydney, sound right to me. Sydney is one of our beloved Patreon supporters, and indicated that Max, you have a sexy voice. Canberra can suck it. All right. Well, <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> um, toxic monogamy, not good. We'll put all the articles that we pulled from in our show notes. You can visit our website, www.podpodcultcast.com. Cult with a V. And we'll see you next Tuesday. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Is that reverse, Dr. Nick? <laughs> <laughs> You've just heard the Pod Pod Cult Cast with your hosts Max, Hannah, Chaston, and Eric. Our theme music is Spencer Blues by Lobo Loco. Our break music is Gabarino from YouTube. Subscribe and review on iTunes or check us out on your favorite player. Visit our website at www.podpodcultcast.com to find all of our show notes and follow us on social media. Thank you so much for listening.